Hey, Jack, how you doing? Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me on. No, my absolute pleasure. And um, you're really kind of pushing the boundary here because I don't think I've had many people, you know, teenagers on the podcast before. Obviously, like when I started this podcast, it was very much geared towards young entrepreneurs. And so I'm really glad to have pe like young entrepreneurs like yourself wanting to come on the podcast. It's really nice. Um, but I just never really know, knew like how young it would, it would go to. Uh, so it's really nice to see like, yeah, teenagers wanting to come on the podcast and teenagers finding value from the podcast. It's really nice. Um, I'm trying to think if I've had a, a guest younger than you and I'm, I'm kind say, of am I the youngest guest yet. I have to be, I, I, I think it's between you and actually guest number one that is going a long way back. Uh, he just went to like university or college. So same as you, I don't know, maybe it's like a few months difference. Who knows? Uh, are you if anyone wants to check that episode out? That's a real throwback that one. Um, but yeah, so, so really nice to have you on. And like, you've written like a couple books as well. It's pretty mental, like within the space of, well, I don't know, you've literally just turned 18 or whatever. So it's like, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote some books. I done some stuff with an investing club, which we'll talk about later. But I guess, yeah, just delving into my more most recent project, the Teen Investing Books. I wrote this book, Teen Investing, by Jack Rosenthal on Amazon. And yeah, the book is a really cool project. It came out of a previous club that I was involved in, where I was really involved in teaching other teenagers how to invest in the stock market. Mm. So after running that club for several years and running it successfully, I wrote a book to educate other teenagers about how to invest in the U.S. stock market primarily. Um and yeah, just kind of going over all my investing teachings, what I personally do when I'm investing and just kind of the book that I wish I had if I was a teenager just getting started in investing. So mm. I put that book up on Amazon, self-published it. And uh, since then, the book has done really well. And it's actually become the number two best-selling book for teen investing on Amazon, which I'm really uh, proud of. Yeah, that's really cool. So let's, I think let's, let's, let's go back to where it all began before you, st before you wrote those books, before, like where you actually got the idea for it. So you started a club, right? Like a club for other teenagers who wanted to invest their money uh, into stocks, into just basically to make a return for the future. I know how like how important investing is. Actually, before we go on, it's just important to say like none of what I say or what Jack says is financial advice. Uh, obviously, like this is all for like entertainment purposes. We're just talking about books, talking about finance, talking about investing. But yeah, none of it's financial advice. Um, yeah, so how did I get started with the club? So we started with the club my freshman year of high school. So that's when I was 14 years old for everyone who's foreign and doesn't know the US system. Um, so I was 14 hmm. years old and I started something called the Young Investors Club. Basically what I did is I convinced the city, okay, you have to put $1,000 in to join and that's going to be your investment in the group portfolio. So everybody invests $1,000 and then we split the money according to what proportion of the money you invested. So say there was $20,000 in the pot, each person put in $1,000, 20 people, each person owns 5% of the investment portfolio and then we run the investment portfolio together. So my freshman year, I decided to start this project. Um, the way that it worked is I didn't want to go through my school because I knew if the school was involved, there'd be all kinds of problems. If there's any time there's real money involved, especially tens of thousands of dollars, the school likes to regulate it heavily. And I knew that caused a lot of problems. So I went totally outside of my school and, um, I couldn't just go to my friends because I didn't have 20 friends that could all invest a thousand dollars in the stock market at 14. So what I instead decided to do was partner with a larger parent organization. So this parent organization of members all up and down the East Coast. And after six months of going through decision makers and uh, loop, basically going up the ladder, so starting with one person, going to their boss, and then their boss, their boss, and scheduling phone calls and coordinating via email, we finally got approval from the guy who was in charge of sending out blast emails to all the members and finally got approved to be on their platform. So we uh, we sent out initials initial email that year, freshman year, we got actually 20 members to sign up. Everyone put in $1,000. This was a $20,000 investment portfolio. Um, and then by the time junior year came around, it was up to 40 members and $40,000 in the investment portfolio. And at the end of that year, the middle of that year, I was like, you know what? I have something cool here. I have about 40 members, but I want to take this to be the biggest and the best. So I was like, I want to grow this to over 100000 that year. And I went very heavily recruiting mode. We sent out hundreds of emails. I made hundreds of phone calls. Um, 
tons of tons of different recruiting efforts. And by the end of that year, we had close to 100 members and over $120,000 in assets, which made us the largest that I'm aware of teen investing club in the country, if not the world, in terms of real assets that we manage. Um, so I ran that club. And then by the time senior year came around, I passed that club off to another high schooler to run because I always wanted to be run by a high schooler. I went off to college. The other high schooler kept running the club and did a great job with it. I, I, like, I like to joke sometimes, sometimes he's better at running the club than I was because I was really good at recruiting members to join the club. But And I was a good operator, but I wasn't like the best operator there could be. He was a really good operator. So it kind of was a great um, team effort. And, uh, and then after running that club, I wrote the book because I really learned how to teach other teenagers how to invest. And that's how I wrote the book. Mm, that's really cool. So when you, when you kind of got that group together, the initial group, like how, like what sort of stuff were like, how did you recruit people? Basically? Like, I know it's quite difficult to recruit the early members, the early adopters. So like how did the whole process come about? Yeah. So we sent out by sending out emails to members of the larger parent network. Um, so they'd have thousands of members and we sent out blast emails to the parents and then say, Hey, this is a club. Is your kid interested in joining contact Jack? And then, uh, and then I'd, people would contact me and I'd usually get like two or three or five different emails every day of new people interested in joining the club, which is really cool. And I remember, I remember back then I made like the mistake of sending my personal email when I should have like set up a different email just for this. Mm. Every single day, my phone would just blow up with just emails and responses to previous emails and then phone calls and it was just getting too much. So I had to, uh, had to create a separate email just for the club. So then like, yeah, but what, what sort of stuff were the sales tactics? Like, how did you get people on board? Because obviously they are literally giving money to you, like, or, or the group or like, well, how we want to do it. So like, yeah. yeah how'd... So first of all, when they invest thousand dollars, it's not giving it to me. It's like, they still own that thousand dollars. They can take it out of the club. In fact, mm. a lot of members started in freshman year and then senior year, they pulled out their thousand dollars with more money. So it was like an earned, let's say an extra $300 between freshman and senior year so they got a thousand dollars back plus three hundred dollars so it's really more of an yeah. investment um so so and as far as convincing them to put in the money well it was a few different reasons one you get to invest alongside other teenagers so hopefully the group wisdom will teach you about investing uh for yourself especially if you're a novice number mm. one number two it allows you to join a network of other teen and uh, teen investors that are interested in investing so you gain access to that network and number three we provide like a lot of great education like we'd have guest speakers come mm. occasionally on calls and teach them about their own specific area so if a guy was like a bond expert we'd have him teach about bonds or if they were you know a trading expert teach about trading so those were all the benefits to being a member of the club mm, that's really interesting so i think it'd be really cool to actually talk about the investment side so obviously like you had but if anything, it was more like a, I guess, just to teach them like the way of investing, I guess, like more educational from, you know, organizing all these different people. And obviously they're dipping the toe in the, dipping their toe in the water of, I guess, investing, which is, which I think should be taught a lot more to young people because a lot of young people don't really know. And like, we've had people on the podcast before, you know, um, this guy called Mr. Money Jar, Timmy. Uh, he was on the podcast before talks about investing and just like personal finance in general. And that's a big struggle for a lot of young people is that they don't really know. They don't have the tools. They don't really know like where to go. Like there's a lot of misinformation out there, which is even more dangerous that I really like, I feel for a lot of young people who fall for stuff like that, because I know like young people don't have like tons of money. So that, that that's quite annoying when I see stuff like that, but yeah, so I think like what you what you did there, but around the educational aspects, like really, really important. Um, like even if I guess like they didn't make that much money, it's not about it's more it's more the educational side. Would you say? Definitely, yeah. No, I mean a thousand dollars, you can only return earn so much of return on that. So mm. yeah, they not so much for the money, but yeah, the education of being around other teenagers that are all investing that was what the real value of the club was. Yeah. So I think what's really important, like what I would love to get onto now is I guess like some teenagers that are, are listening, but not even teenagers, like early adults, early twenties, or even like thirties. Um, how would you kind of approach the concept of investing as a first time investor? Because it's, it's kind of like a, like people don't know a lot. That's what, that's what we just talked about, right? Like it is a difficult area to get into. Um, there's so much information online. A lot of it, isn't true a lot of it is just like these these get rich quick schemes that are just like false people people are deterred by the fact that 
there is a risk element involved. So yeah, how would you kind of start as as a young, you know, investor in the market? Yeah, so a few things. Um, if I'd say for the majority of investors, I'd say what you should do is decide which market you want to invest in. So if you want to invest in the UK market or US market or, you know, you're in a different country and you want to invest in that market. But like, let's say for me, I want to invest in the United States market. Okay. Um, for the majority of investors, you shouldn't choose just like a few stocks and just watch those stocks. What you should instead do is invest in an index fund, which are really great investing vehicles. They charge very low fees. So as opposed to previous kind of older funds that existed, which would charge like something crazy, like a two and 20 fee, which is extremely high. That means 2% of the money you give them, they charge every single year, plus 20% of the return they give you. So that, that'll cut a huge portion out of your profits. Instead, invest in these index funds, which charge 0.2 or 0.1 or 0.05% of your assets. So instead of $1,000 and they charge you $10, this one's charging you, you know, 50 cents, you know, sometimes as low as that. So it could really, mm. it, it really, um, it's a really more cost effective way to invest. So invest in the index funds. And then as far as which one, I would say if you're the majority investors should put all their money in the S&P 500 and just wait, not, not touch mm. it, just hold off and just let your money ride. Especially if you're younger, like me, and you have a long time horizon to invest and you don't need the money tomorrow or next year, put it all in the S&P 500. That means you're just making a bet that the top 500 U S companies are going to continue to perform and continue to grow, which I'd say is a very strong bet. And I mean, you know, I was going to, it makes way more sense to put your money there as opposed to leaving it in the bank. Because inflation will eat away your money at about 2% a year. So 2% of your money is being basically devalued every single year, as opposed to putting in the S&P 500, which has produced a return of 8 to 10% every year for the last 50 years. Um, and you don't have to do anything. You know, you don't have to like trade mm. stocks. You don't have to do a lot of complicated equations or anything like that. So majority of investors put all your money in the S&P 500. That's what I'd say. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually fully agree with you. And just quickly on the fees element, like uh, I have a I have a link in my bio, like this this new this this trading app that I really use. I love it. I always put my money in the S P five hundred with that trading app called Free Trade. Uh, in the U K, it's like it's basically the, the U K version of Robinhood in the U S. Um, but yeah, if like if anyone wants a free stock using my link, it's in the it's in the bio description below. Um, it's the one that I use the most because it's like zero fees, and I put my money in the S P five hundred there. Um, pretty much like every month and I just add to it regardless of the price regardless of like what the market's doing I just put a set amount in it every month um, and I just yeah just let it be like just let it chill there because it, it as you said like it will probably well like Warren Buffett said himself like the S&P 500 will outperform a lot of a lot of professional investors um, over over like a set time time horizon so and that's not even factoring in the time and the effort and the stress that you're putting yourself under if you trade individual stocks. Um, S and P 500 tracks like the top 500 companies, and it's like it's pretty easy to make a return on. And like, and it's obviously this isn't financial advice, but like, give on the on the data within the last like ten over over like ten year or twenty year horizon, it always has made a positive return. Like, it just always has. Yeah, so in yeah. ten year period always always performs strongly. Yeah, so I completely I completely agree with you on that advice. Um, but I guess, uh, but I guess like if you're if you are young and you you start making like an income, uh, just from like a job or whatever, like entrepreneurship, if you make your own income or whatever it is, um, like do you think like setting some aside for like more risky assets, like it's worth? It's worth doing. Well, I think that we talked about the conversation of cryptocurrency, um, which I think you can't talk about investing without talking about cryptocurrency nowadays. And yeah, I have seen a lot of young people start to invest some of their money in some of these more riskier crypto assets now within the crypto world. Mm. Not before I say, sorry, I'm not an expert in cryptocurrency. I have some cryptocurrency, but I'm not an expert in it. But to my understanding, within the crypto world, there's like the blue chip stocks, which is like bitcoin and ethereum and then there's the lot more risky ones which are a lot more volatile and i would recommend staying away from um <laughs> but as far as as far as bitcoin and ethereum so i personally own some ethereum 
I got a really strong return on that. I bought at 1700 It just passed 3000 So although I bought in much later compared to most people, I still made a strong return on it. Mm. Um, so I think that that is a really strong currency, and I think it's going to continue to perform for the future. I'd say the reason why, a few reasons. Uh, one, because of inflation, which the general dollar and other currencies, European currencies, are kind of eroding in value each year. So people are looking for alternative ways to store their money. Number one. Number two, I think that Gen Z um, is going to only continue to gain wealth, right? It makes sense. Like, okay, Gen Z and millennials, they don't, they only have X portion of the world's wealth right now. But as they get older, presumably they're going to have more money just because they're going to earn more money and uh, other generations aren't going to have as much. So I'd say as Gen Z and millennials have more money, they're going to continue to put more of their money in cryptocurrency just because they understand it so much better than you know, a boomer or like an 80 year old mm. ever could. I mean, in a, I know the majority of 80 year olds, I don't think would ever touch a cryptocurrency asset in their life. You know, even if it was the best deal ever, they would never touch my grandfather. I'm thinking of, you know, he thinks yeah, yeah, he's yeah. burning money. He's like, I would not invest $1 into that thing. It's like the same thing for him as throwing a dollar in the trash can. Um, but a lot of millennials and Gen Z who've been around online currency their entire life, who, they're used to the fact they just look at their phone for their bank account balance. That didn't exist, you know, uh, 150 mm. years ago when they have to actually go exactly. to the bank and, you know, get a receipt and touch the real money. Um, so I think Gen Z is a lot more used to this kind of digital money. And I think that there's not a very big difference between digital dollars and digital uh, cryptocurrency. So that's the second reason. And the third reason is I think it'll be a great replacement for gold. A lot of people just mm. hold their money in gold as a hedge against currency. Um, not so much for the gold value now. A lot of the investors just put it as a hedge. And I think that a lot of those investors will start to shift from investing in gold, which has a $7 trillion market cap, to investing in cryptocurrency, which I think Bitcoin has a $1 trillion market cap and all of cryptocurrency has a $2 trillion market cap. So I think that's only going to continue to shift more into crypto and then go further beyond that. So those are the reasons why I like cryptocurrency. Yeah, no, I could talk about crypto for a long time because I do... I've held I've held crypto since 2017. Uh, like Ethereum, I was my first one. I believe in Ethereum way more than I believe in Bitcoin Same. personally. Yeah. Um, I think everybody said, does. That's why the price is going through the roof right now. Yeah, yeah, but like, like even further, like, yeah, 2017, I I bought like my first Ethereum. Uh, back then it was like not as valuable as is now. Create like it's gone up a lot. Uh, another one is Ripple that I really believe in. Um, Bitcoin, I feel like might go out the spotlight soon because, because like before it was really valuable where you could convert that into buying other like alt currencies, other, like other cryptos. Whereas now you can buy other cryptos with like, you don't have to convert it to Bitcoin first. You can convert it into other things. So I don't know whether the Bitcoin will like, because obviously like the first cryptocurrency might not be the, the, the leader. The, it might be replaced by something else. It might be Ethereum. Yeah. Who knows? Um, but anyway, like well, this I mean, isn't Ethereum a. Is, they use Ethereum to trade NFTs. So exactly, you know, like, Ethereum is a lot more used. You know, the gas prices on NFTs are all Ethereum. Ethereum seems to, and like the guy that bought the uh, sixty-nine million dollar NFT, that was all paid in Ethereum. Mm -hmm. so it seems to me like Ethereum is really going to be the much more useful asset of the cryptocurrencies. Yeah. Having said that, though, like Ethereum's got pretty high fees, so like. Ethereum might be replaced by another NFT, uh, like uh, other crypto that that you can still trade NFTs with. Um, so it'd be interesting to see like how that how that happens because the fees are pretty like crazy high. Anyways, uh, I could talk about crypto for so long, um, but that is a pretty risky investment. Crypto, like, there's no way of getting around it. So, like, yeah, if you did have a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars, whatever. How would you kind of allocate that towards, you know, traditional investments such as like S&P 500, which is the risk is fairly low. And like, how would you range the risk basically? Yeah, well, I'd say the most important thing you're starting off with is you only have $2,000. Now, I know what mm. you're going to say. Oh, a lot of teenagers don't have that much. Well, so I talk about this in my book, Teen Investing, once again. Um, and the very the most important thing that I say is you need to bank, if you're, as your first teenager, as you're a teenager, you need to bank your first $5,000 which I know at first seems like, okay, that seems like a lot of money for a teenager. But if you really think about it, it's actually very attainable. 
if you work a summer job for $10 to $15 an hour and you work a few hours a week during the summer, you can easily have a few thousand dollars saved away just by the end of one summer. Not to mention if you work a few summers during your high school years. So you can easily achieve the 5000 Now, you have to be cautious with spending. You can't spend a lot of money. You have to learn money principles to, you know, not second you earn $300, go spend on an Xbox. You have to learn how to save it. But if you if you decently understand how to save money and you can go out and earn, a, earn money from a job, you can easily save your first $5,000. So that would be the first thing. First, you need to get for five. Don't worry about trying to invest one or two. It's such a small amount of money that the return on that is just going to be so minimal to your overall life. You need to get to that five first because 5000 the return on that 10%, $500 a year. Okay, that's the amount of money that's actually real to teenagers, $40 a month. That's an amount of money that can actually affect someone's life in a small way. So that's the first thing, get to 5000 And then as far as once you have the 5000 then it depends what you want to do. I'd say the majority of teenagers put like, 4,000 into S&P 500 and maybe 1,000 into like their favorite cryptocurrency. That, I'd say that's a great plan for like the majority of teenagers out there. Mm. Yeah, but there's also like, I guess like investments in between that. You don't have to go from like stocks to crypto. There's like investments in between like yeah, the varying there's levels. Of, and there's a whole yeah. bunch of different kinds of stocks. But I'd say like the majority of teenagers, the S&P 500 makes the most sense because they're not interested in like daily trading or anything like that. They just want to leave the money like they would in a bank account and just watch it grow over time. Mm. Yeah. Another one that I've utilized pretty well is, is peer to peer lending, which was pretty healthy up until COVID. Like, uh, basically you just lend your money to, to small businesses and then they pay you which back. One on. you so Prosper lending club funding, funding circle. I don't like, I think the UK ones and the U S ones are probably different, but funding circle has been pretty good. Uh, up until COVID, like obviously a lot of small businesses defaulted on loans and I still made a positive return. Don't, don't get me wrong. However, like it wasn't as much as before. Uh, so like once, once COVID like calms down and people start going to shops and restaurants and stuff and like stuff like that, then I'll, I'll be going back into that because that provided say, I think it provided me an 8% return, uh, overall, which isn't bad. Like, and it's monthly, it's monthly recurring revenue like profit. So yeah, that was pretty good. And yeah, obviously no, like I diversified. Yeah, I mm. used to do that too back in the day. I used to do uh, Prosper and Lending Club when I was actually like 10 years old. The way that it worked is my dad lent me some money at a 1% interest rate. He lent me $5,000 at a 1% interest rate. And then I relended out on the peer to peer trading platforms for 8%, kind of like what you're saying. And then I kept the 7% spread. So mm -hmm. I was making like, 250 bucks or something a year off of the difference between the interest I was paying my dad, which is the same thing he's paying the bank. So if he had 5,000 in the bank, he'd be earning 1%. And if he had 5,000, me earning the same amount. And I was relending it out at 8%, keeping that spread. So it's mm. funny you mentioned that because I was doing peer to peer loans a while ago too. Yeah, it's a good one. It's it's a reliable one also. Like it's, you don't earn massive amounts. I'm, don't get me wrong, but it's like, it's, it's a good way to diversify your investments around different, different areas of, of the economy um so it's good I, I i believe in that i think it's pretty cool um but anyway i'd love to move on to your newest book so so teen teen entrepreneur right yep teen entrepreneurship so how how did you get around to writing that so that i wrote while i was in college i don't have a copy of the book with me so i can't show you but it's a uh, teen entrepreneurship on amazon by jack rosenthal and yeah so i got into that because in addition to being an investor i've been an entrepreneur for a long period of time and within college you know i was just i was basically bored for a couple of weeks i was like hey let me let me knock out another book so uh within a month and a half i went from starting to finishing a whole nother book uh and and i knew a lot more about the process this time because i already written a previous book so i knew a lot more about the self-publishing process and what to expect um but yeah within a month and a half i went from having the idea to write the book to finishing a completed version of the book Let's talk about that self-publishing, I guess, aspect for a second, because I think that's, I think that like I've had, I've had people on the podcast before that have, they've been, they have had like books out. One of them has, has also released a book self-published very recently. Um, how does the whole process come about? Like, how does, how does that work? Yeah. So I guess I'll walk you through in a couple steps. Um, first off, you got to write the book, most important step. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you gotta spend a lot of time getting a lot of the, you know, word count necessary. Typically books have 
between 20 and 100,000 words, I was told is the average. So you got to you got to write the book first. Once you wrote the book, then you can go, go to Amazon. It's called Amazon KDP and Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing. And you uh, you fill out all the information for the book, title, you know, upload the book, design a cover. I went on a website called Fiverr. I'm sure you've heard of it to design mm-hmm. a cover. I paid someone like very minimal amount of money compared to what you'd pay uh, like a big publishing company. Big publishing yeah, company, yeah. thousands of dollars in design fees. I paid someone like a hundred bucks to design the cover. Um, so cover designed, create the book or upload the book, then launch it on Amazon, set the price. And then you launch it on Amazon. So now you have the listing up on Amazon. Now, the most important question is that's step one, write the book. Step two, list on Amazon. Step three, sales. So how do you get the sales? That's the most important aspect to this. So with the sales, that's a lot more of a tricky piece. Um, generally, what you want to do is promote it on social media. So I mean, I post it on my own personal Instagram, but that's just like my personal friends and family. So that's not like a big network of people. A lot of what you do is well, you go on podcasts like this one. That's one thing. Um, another thing you do is try and try and build up a little bit of your own social media following on other platforms. So like try and build out a YouTube channel to promote it or something like that. Uh, go around to local bookstores and try and get it in those bookstores. That's what I did. You know, I drove around one Saturday and went to all the local bookstores. I offered to put it in there. What else did I do? Did a whole bunch of stuff. Well, and did the, did some of the local bookstores like buy your book to yep. stock in their stock in their store? Yep, on, on uh, what's it called? Direct on on site, they bought the book. That's uh, cool. So I bought a couple copies of it. I'm like, hey, you guys want some? You know, but I learned a little bit about sales. Uh, previous to this, I knew a little bit about sales, so I knew mm. kind of a little more about how to pitch it to them. And uh, that was actually rare. A lot of books don't buy book. A lot of bookstores don't buy books like directly. They buy them on consignment from local authors. So. In other words, they'll only pay you if they sell, but I convinced a few of them just to buy them directly from me. Um, so I got some book sales from that. You know, it's also about, you know, you call up some, I'd say friends that might, you know, have a lot of, in my case, uh, teenagers or, you know, young people and say, hey, you guys want 10 copies or, hey, you know, you go to some kind of event, bring 20 copies with you. Anyway, that's pretty much how you sell them. Mm, that's really cool. So, I mean, and. I knew a little bit about this, but not too much. So you can literally just go to Amazon, the website that you said, and publish your your writing as like a Word document or whatever. And there you go. Like it's already done. You can just order on Amazon and it's to your house. Yep, correct. And Amazon will do all the printing and shipping. Wow. They've made it really easy. They've made it scary, yeah. like dangerously easy. And that's why anybody can write a book these days. It's really, it's more mm. about the marketing, I'd say. Yeah, and how how's the how are the two books done? Like, uh, I guess I know, I know that like teen investing book you've done, you wrote you wrote that a couple of years ago now, and then the new book that you have now, like, you must have learned a lot about like writing books, publishing books, promoting yeah, teen them. Investing, teen investing, I wrote in the end of two thousand nineteen, so December two thousand nineteen, so it's been out over a year now. Um, learned a lot about just the sales process. It's cool to you know check Amazon sales every day and watch the sales come in. That that's really cool for me. Uh, and what's so cool is it's like a passive source of income. So like, you know, this podcast I'm doing right now, people will be listening to this for weeks now without me even having to sell anything or do anything to anyone. Um, and, and nevertheless on Amazon every single day, you know, we get book sales coming in. So I don't have to do anything. It's just like a total passive source of income and Amazon sends the money to you. So that was a really cool thing that I discovered. I was like, wow, you can like actually make another income source off selling these books. Hmm. So did that. Um, what well, sorry, what was your question again? Well, how, how, like how many have been sold and stuff like, like oh, how many countries have gone to stuff like that? Oh, it's gone to like every country across the world. Um, sales, we sold thousands. I don't know exactly how many books we sold in teen investing, but we sold thousands of books. Um, the teen entrepreneurship one just came out more recently. Now for this one, it's a little harder because once you launch two books, it like Amazon doesn't tell you which sales from which book. And they're both the same price, so I, I can't tell which sales come from which books anymore. Yeah, but this yeah. month had a really strong month in terms of total sales, so I'm guessing a lot of that has come from the Teen Entrepreneurship book that I listed on Amazon like a month ago. Um, mm. So yeah, so the Teen Entrepreneurship book's off to a good start, and the uh, the Teen Investing one continues to continues to do really well. Interesting stuff about book sales. This is you know this is just what you learn through becoming an author. Q4 
is actually the best quarter for book sales. That's when you sell the most amount of books. I don't. I think it's because mm -hmm. it's around the holiday time, so people are buying books as presents for other people. Um, but yeah, that in that month, I think we sold like December or the month before that. I think we sold like more books than we sold like in the past like three months combined, all in one month. Wow, well, uh, December. Yeah. It's Christmas. Yeah, it's definitely Christmas. That's pretty crazy. I didn't. I didn't know like Christmas had that sort of power. Um, it's pretty mental. Anyways, like I think I think when I wrap it up there, thank you so much, Jack, for for coming on the podcast and sharing your story. Like, still crazy young, so you're still pretty much at the beginning of your story. Um, but it's good to get a glimpse into like how you actually self publish and like how how you can invest as a teenager. Obviously, once again, this is not a financial advice. Neither of us are financial advisors. This is just for entertainment purposes. Um, but yeah, it was so good having you on. Thank you so much for coming on the, the podcast, Jack. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Everybody, if you want to go check out my book, it's Teen Investing on Amazon by Jack Rosenthal. So go get yourself a copy or the other one's Teen Entrepreneurship. Anyway, yeah, really okay. appreciate you having me on. And uh, oh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, follow me at starsocial.pro. Sweet. Thank you so much, Jack. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll speak soon. Thanks. Have a good one.